Hey there everyone, Professor Tomney here, and I just wanted to remind everybody to head over to Chem Complete if you are enjoying these free lecture series. We have available free resources, we also have services for one-on-one -on -one tutoring, and right now we're in the midst of doing the substitution nucleophilic uh, reaction course, and we do have a guide available for this. So if you click on Buy Guides on the website, you'll be brought up. Uh, we've got a couple of them here, we're working on new ones every month. So the one that you see right here says Nucleophilic Substitution and Elimination Guide. It's available for $5, and you can just add it to the cart. It really helps to support the channel if you have the ability to do this. I'm trying to keep the courses completely free on YouTube so that everybody has a free resource to learn from, because I do believe you should be able to educate yourself for free or virtually free uh, when it comes to this material. But that helps us continue to produce content if you can support the channel. And with the guide, you will get a very detailed set of notes. So it's essentially a small book that I've put together. It's got images that we've used. It also goes into far more detail than the individual lectures do, because I am able to write in great detail here and allow you guys to pick it up. Now, once you get to the end of these guides, and I do have them for others, the most popular one is the uh, unknown structure course where we use NMR, IR, and whatnot to solve unknown structures. I always have practice problems. So just like in a book, you will get practice problems with very well-crafted questions. Uh, keep in mind that these are the types of questions I would have used on my exams uh, or my homeworks when I was teaching organic chemistry. And then, of course, I include the answer key. So you will get detailed answers and explanations to all of this. So if you're looking for additional practice and you can help support the channel, I greatly appreciate it. And if not, just watching the videos and sharing them with friends that are in class that might be struggling already supports the channel plenty. So thank you very much and on to today's lecture. All right, everyone, welcome to the next lecture in the Nucleophilic Substitution and Elimination series. And in today's lecture, we are going to start going over factor two, which is the position of the leaving group. So this is the next important factor you need to consider when looking at substitution and elimination reactions. So in the previous lecture, we talked about the identity of the leaving group. Is it a halide? Is it a tosylate? Where does it fall in terms of its effectiveness? at leaving and we said that a good leaving group is a weak base and we kind of drew some correlations to Ka and PKA. So now we want to talk about where the leaving group is actually going to be positioned on the alkyl uh, chain that is going to be undergoing a substitution or elimination reaction. So uh, I have an important note at the beginning here, and it says, while the identity of the leaving group has the same ranking for both SN1 and SN2, the position of the leaving group does not follow the same trend between the reactions. So that is to say that when we looked at the previous lecture, the leaving group priority in terms of tosylate and sulfates being the best, all the way down to hydroxides, alkoxides, etc. being the worst, that was the same for both SN2 and SN1. They both have the same priority in terms of the identity of the leaving group. But then we also said in that lecture that will not be true of the other three factors. We're going to start seeing some reverse in what is preferred, and that's exactly what this statement is saying here. So now we're talking about the position. So what is meant by position of leaving group. So when we talk about position, you can see there's some examples here, primary, secondary, tertiary. There's also methyl type position, but we're talking about um, if I were to have an alkyl group, right, CH3, CH2, um, and then let's say chlorine, okay, that this, because this halogen is only attached to one other carbon, the carbon that it's attached to, that would make it primary, right? So then we could also have something like a secondary, where we could say CH3, and then CH, CH3, right? And then the halogen is up here. This would be considered a secondary halogen, because the carbon that it is attached to is attached to one, two other carbons. So what's going to happen is, as we continue, we go to tertiary, right? And then methyl, which we can abbreviate ME, methyl would be below this, it would be just a CH3 with the leaving group. 
Um, but as we continue to increase, we're going to be increasing the sterics, right? So sterics is a word for how much uh, atomic material is surrounding a certain site, the actual physical atoms. And as they pile up, we usually tend to view sterics as um, a bad thing, right? It leads to lower stability because atoms contain electrons, and the more electrons you pack or crowd into a certain area, you're going to end up usually having a repulsion. Um, and sterics is the word we use to represent that. Now, that doesn't mean that tertiary leaving groups are bad, because as we increase the number of substituents around, while we do increase the sterics, we also increase the ability to stabilize cations through a process called hyperconjugation. So we have to consider when we start looking at these, what will an SN2 favor and what will an SN1 favor? Okay, are we going to be forming cations that need that electronic stability or are we going to be completing a reaction uh, with no cations and then we start to get a little more concerned with our sterics because everything has to be happening at once. So to start, let's take a look at what positions are going to be favored in SN2. And what we want to do is bring up the general mechanism to take a look at the kinetics again, right? So in an SN2, we've got some leaving group X that's attached, okay? And for the moment, let's not worry if it's primary, secondary, tertiary, etc. We just want to look at the general mechanism. Okay, so that leaving group's going to leave and the SN2 requires that a nucleophile is going to come in at the same time the leaving group is leaving. So this is all what's called a concerted mechanism. It's all going to happen at the same time. Okay? And when we have concerted mechanisms in a single step, we don't have any intermediates. So that means that there's no carbocation that's going to be involved in this process. right? And then we substitute the nucleophile in afterwards. So because of this, we don't have the presence of a cation. There's no hyperconjugation or electronic stability that we need to really consider. What we're concerned with is the fact that a nucleophile has to get in to a crowded area as the leaving group is also leaving at the same time. So there's a lot going on at the site of the reaction. Okay, And when that's the case, sterics tends to be the constraint. We want to start looking at sterics in a situation like that. All right, now sterics, it becomes important because if I'm trying to get this all to occur in a small area and it's getting electronically crowded, the more crowding that's there, the more difficult this is going to be. So you can imagine that it's almost like um, when you have a large crowd at a concert and then you have some popular singer or performer and that crowd, right, is sort of blocking your way. The more people that are there, and the singer or the performer is the site of the reaction, you've got all of this interference, right? So if a lot of those people were to clear out, or it wasn't as crowded, it would be much easier for you to get up there and interact with the site. So it's the same here. The general premise holds that when we get ready to take a look at these reactions, we want as few distractions or steric bulk around the reaction site as possible. So it turns out that when we have methyl groups, these are going to be the least sterically hindered of the bunch. And the reason for that is this carbon only has three hydrogens. Okay, Hydrogens are relatively small atoms in comparison to everything else. So it's a lot easier for the nucleophile to come in right, to this site that only has three hydrogens. Now what happens after you go from methyl to primary? Okay, so as we move along, now the leaving group is attached to a carbon that's going to have two hydrogens, and it's also going to have a methyl group. Now a methyl group is going to be more sterically cumbersome than the hydrogens. So what used to just be a hydrogen over here has now become a large bulky methyl group. This becomes problematic as we start to pile them up. So you can imagine as I move to the secondary example, a secondary is going to have even larger steric issues than the primary does because now I've got 
the leaving group attached to a carbon that only has one hydrogen, and it's got two of these bulky methyl groups here, right? And then tertiary, same thing. So the general order in which we are going to see the SN2 prefer its leaving group is that methyl groups will be the most reactive by far. Then primaries. Secondaries are possible. However, they need to be in a low steric environment. So that is to say, if you have a secondary um, leaving group, you don't want, for instance, a t-butyl group on the carbon right next to that. That would be very sterically hindering uh, if that neighbor was bulky. So you want very clear, low uh, steric situations if you have secondary. And then much worse than secondary, okay, to the point it does not occur, is tertiary. Tertiaries will not occur for an SN2 reaction. And that's because the steric crowding, the steric hindrance, is so overwhelming at that point that there's simply no option for the nucleophile to come in successfully. All right. So now we have to realize, because we've been talking about this in the context of the fact that uh, SN1 and SN2 are going to have opposite uh, desires when it comes to these leaving groups. So we can say right here as a sort of a prelude that tertiary is going to be the best for the SN1, followed by acceptable secondaries, okay? And then primaries are not going to be able to do SN1s very well, okay? And then methyls, absolutely not. There's not going to be a methyl SN1 reaction, all right? So the question is, why is this the case? And again, we're now going to take a look at the SN1 and its reaction in order to consider this. So in the case of an SN1, you have to look at the rate limiting step. And in an SN1, I'm going to draw out a tertiary here because we know that tertiary should be preferred. Right? In an SN1, we're going to have a leaving group. The leaving group needs to leave, and it's not at the same time a nucleophile is coming in. Now we know that, now that we've talked about SN2, the sterics here are not going to allow for that. So what can happen is the leaving group can leave by itself. That is the rate limiting step in order to generate a carbocation. Once the leaving group is out of the way, we now have the ability to come in and attack this carbocation with the nucleophile. Because we do not have the same level of steric hindrance, and what was once a tetrahedral compound has turned into a trigonal planar compound. It's flat and it can be attacked from both sides. All right, now we'll have more on that later in terms of stereochemistry, but when you're dealing with SN1 reactions, you can get usually a mixture of products, and that is because you have the ability to attack from in front as well as a backside attack, whereas SN2, you can only do a backside attack due to sterics. That large leaving group is in the front. All right, now, when we look at this, this carbocation is going to benefit from hyper conjugation. All right, now, I have done other videos on my channel that explain what hyperconjugation is, so I'm not going to go into that in great detail here. But in general, what happens is a carbocation is in need of electronic activity. And so when you have carbon hydrogen bonds, not just hydrogen bonds, but carbon hydrogen bonds that are adjacent to the carbocation that is contained in this p orbital, okay, you basically have a stabilizing effect from the electrons in this bond that are adjacent to it. That is hyperconjugation in a nutshell. So that means the more carbon hydrogen bonds, and I have to have methyl groups or CH groups in order to do that, but the more of these types of bonds that exist adjacent to a carbocation, the more stability is going to be offered to that carbocation. And that is why methyl carbocations don't exist. Because in a methyl carbocation, you only have hydrogens. You do not have any of the CH bonds. And so therefore, there's nothing that can hyperconjugate with that p orbital that contains the uh, carbocation. Okay, I say contains the carbocation. It's really an empty p orbital looking for electrons. A carbocation is not a physical thing contained inside of a p orbital. All right, but for the sake of drawing it two dimensionally, that's what we're looking at here. So 
this is the favored process here. We're going to have tertiary, secondary, primary, methyl, and it's because we're looking for electronic stability. And electron stability, or electronic stability, okay, is going to come from the hyperconjugation. So, the next question, are there any positions that both SN1 and SN2 favor or disfavor? And the answer here is yes, okay? particularly when you get into resonance or lack thereof. So there are two types that are favored by both, and that is known as allylic and benzylic. Okay, now these are their own group. The allylic is going to be when you have a pi bond that is directly adjacent to a leaving group. So something like this. Now this is important because when the leaving group leaves, okay, it's going to benefit from some sort of resonance. And even in an SN2, while it doesn't officially leave a carbocation, as this starts to depart, you have a partial positive buildup at this site. And the partial positive buildup will still gain some benefit from the fact that there's brief delocalization that could potentially be occurring during that transition state, right? Benzylic is even better. It follows the same general premise, but now you've got the benefit of three additional resonance structures from a benzene ring, okay? Now, keep in mind, because a lot of students get this confused, right here, okay, there's a CH2 in between the ring and the chlorine. You do not want the chlorine or the leaving group to be directly on the ring. So there are also situations like this. We've got the ring, the leaving group is directly on the ring, or you've got the double bond and the leaving group is directly on the pi bond. It's not adjacent to it. Okay, this is known as vanillic, and this is just, you use the general term aryl leaving group. Uh, this stands for aromatic. These two Okay, because of the way that they interact with the uh, p orbital overlap and the sp2 hybridization with the leaving groups, they are not well suited as leaving groups for the intermediates um, or for these substitution reactions. Okay, so the disfavored portion, the aryl and the vanillic are not acceptable leaving groups. Reactions will not go when you have these, whether it's SN1 or SN2. In terms of favored leaving groups, you've got the benzylic and you have the allylic, both of which are going to be favored due to resonance. Okay? So resonance is what's helping out there. Resonance, uh, in general, is going to be a good thing because it helps to stabilize any partial positive buildup or positive buildup that we come across. So that is going to conclude the position of the leaving group for SN1 and SN2. And the same premise for E1 and E2 when we get to the eliminations, all right? So just to wrap up, the SN1 and SN2 will both favor allylic and benzylic. They will both disfavor the aryl and vanillic. And then when it comes to the regular non-resonance or non-SP2 hybridized situations, the SN2 will favor the least sterically hindered. So the methyl, the primaries there, a couple of secondaries if they're not hindered, no tertiaries. And the SN1 is going to be favoring the tertiary and secondaries due to their hyperconjugation. The primaries would be rare if ever. They probably wouldn't exist. And methyls most definitely would not exist. There's no hyperconjugation whatsoever for methyl. Methyl cations are unicorns. They don't happen. All right. So that is it. We have now concluded factor two for this lecture. So as always, if the video and the lesson was helpful, go ahead and leave a like. And if you comment, we will try to interact and get back with you. Thank you for the support you always show us. Please subscribe, hit the little bell. You'll be up to date with notifications. And as always, check out chemcomplete.com. You can get a hold of us on there, and we've got lots of great stuff that you can browse. So until next time, good luck with your studies, and we will see you then.